Anybody hungry? Yeah. We're going to talk about food. I apologize if it makes it worse. Now, I don't know that it will make anybody too terribly hungry. The scripture reading we have today from Isaiah and from Matthew both talk about bread, both talk about food and feeding. But you have to know that food in Scripture can usually be taken two ways. Literally, as actual food that you munch and consume, and figuratively, as something else. The food means something else. It's not literal food, it's figurative food. The neat thing is, you can usually take it both ways. Uh, we've often heard that Lutherans are a not an either-or, but a both-and people. And this is one of those ways where we get that uh, name applied to us. We have literal food and figurative food. So I want to walk through the reading from Isaiah and a little bit through the Gospel of Matthew and talk about how that food is literal food and also figurative food and how we can then consume what God gives us both literally and figuratively. Are you ready? Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and del delight yourselves in rich food. Now, that could be literally talking about food. Right? We see feeding ministries taking place in which folks who have no food can come and get food. We have occasions where perhaps you've been inclined to share your food with someone who didn't have any. Uh, maybe just a person at a picnic that was, didn't get a piece of chicken. Oh, you want some of mine? Sure. I mean, it doesn't have to be a homeless person who's been hungry for days. It can just be a friend. Uh, sharing food is part of the Christian ethos. It's part of what makes us who we are. Food is central to so much of what we do, especially in the Lutheran tradition. Uh, last night I was at a big wedding feast, and uh, Michelle Parker was there. Uh, this was for Ralph and Marika Aragon. Uh, many of you know uh, Ralph and Marika from... Christmas Eve, when Marika comes and sings uh, Silent Night in German. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, anyway, there was a long table set up with food. And the line came up and around behind the table, past all of these warmer trays, and people were loading up plates with food. Can I tell you what we ate? Oh, my goodness. I won't make you hungry. Um, but Michelle came up, I noticed and started going down the other side of the table. No one else had gone down the other side. And someone said, hey, I think you've got the right idea. And I said, she's a Lutheran. She knows how to work both sides of the table. <laughs> I mean, that's how potlucks work. You just walk down one side, you walk down both sides. You feed more people faster that way. We've got that part of it down, okay? No, we share food. It's a big part of our ritual life together. We'll talk about communion in a little bit. But it's also part of our fellowship life. Food is important. It's central. And yet the uh, prophet is asking us to consider what we get besides food. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? I could go into uh, different kinds of food out there today. I'm of a mind that some of the things you buy in the grocery store are not food, but are food stuff. I mean, you can consume it, and it will fill you, um, but it's probably not going to satisfy you. My wife is driving this home, especially right now. Uh, many of you know Christy has been diagnosed with celiac disease, which is a disorder that your body creates uh, when it's had too much gluten. Gluten is that stuff in bread that makes it stringy and st stretchy and chewy, uh, which is why so much gluten-free bread is uh, crumbly and crunchy. <laughs> um, the body says, hey, wait a minute, this gluten is too much, and so it begins to attack it. 
sends a lot of white blood cells out to get it. Uh, but then it gets changed so that those white blood cells then turn on the lining of the gut itself and begin attacking it. So it's an autoimmune disorder. Uh, it's really destructive to the intestines. And so she's having to go off of gluten probably for the rest of her life uh, and learn to live without it, but also to let her gut heal. That's the hardest part. She gets really exhausted um, we are beginning to understand why, because her body doesn't take nutrients in the way it used to, uh, because the gut just can't. It will heal and it will restore, uh, but that takes time. We have to ask ourselves why. Why did that happen? How did that happen? And there are a lot of theories floating around out there. Um, it has not been studied as well as perhaps it will. In a few years' time, we may know more about why it works the way it does. But suffice it to say that we thought we were doing a good thing. We bred wheat to have more protein, to have more gluten, because more protein's good, right? What does protein do? Makes you strong, yeah. And since we were going to save the world by feeding the starving multitudes, we wanted to make sure that the wheat we were sending to other places was full of good nutrition. There are children in communities in Africa developing celiac disease. Why? What is it about what they're eating? Uh, you would think wheat is good, yes? Wheat is good for you. Bread is good. The Bible is full of examples of why bread is good. Um, but not in this case, it's not. Somehow, when we got our paws on it, we changed it, um, and it doesn't have the same effect. Why doesn't it affect, affect everybody? Well, I don't know. Everybody's different. Why do we spend our money on things that don't satisfy, which is not bread? Well, we, we spend our money on things which are not bread because she can't eat bread anymore. That's why. Um, but no, why do we buy things that don't satisfy? Why do we buy food that isn't really food? There's a whole world of uh, discussion wrapped up in that. Suffice it to say, I think we've been duped corporately into thinking that food is not really food and what is food isn't. So we buy a lot of junk. Now, I'm not suggesting that in order to be a Christian, you have to eat nothing but organic food. Um, no, not at all. But we do need to be careful about our food choices and what we eat. That's one reason why we've started the garden here at Bethany. Oftentimes, uh, the poor have access to food, but the quality of that food is not very good. Have you ever heard the term a food desert? It stands for a place where uh, you couldn't go buy food without traveling a distance, a certain radius, so many miles. If you live in a food desert, it means you have no access to fresh food. Fresh food is the key word. And so that's why we, I, when I asked Smokey, I said, what sort of things should we grow? And a couple of years ago, he said, I don't know, you know, potatoes, carrots. And the more we talked about it, the more we realized, let's grow things that you don't have to, to cook in order to eat. Things you might find on a veggie tray. Things you might find in the fridge. Something that a mom can chop up into pieces so that when the kids get home, they open the fridge and there's carrot sticks and zucchini sticks waiting for them as a snack. Something that they ordinarily wouldn't have access to is available. And we know it's full of nutrition coming out of this garden. It helps to think about what we eat. In a literal sense, there's a call to eat what is good. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. You're getting tired of hearing me tell you about my trip to Paul Gauchy's garden, but it was that influential to go and to taste. Good morning to you, too. <laughs> She's hungry. That's what that is. I know that sound. Uh, to go and to taste spinach that tasted like spinach. To go and to eat fennel that tasted like candy. To go and have broccoli that had such a depth of flavor 
When it tastes that good, you know it's good for you. God didn't create all of these taste buds in here for nothing. And yet we've taken what is sweet and made it hypersweet. We've taken what is good and made it salty and made it hyper salty. We overrun these taste buds that we've been given. So delight yourselves in rich food carefully. Too much rich food and, uh, well, uh, arteries won't be happy, right? Enough on that. That's the literal side of the food. We see that in the Gospel of Matthew. The literal side of hunger. The crowds are hungry. And our socialist savior says, oh, no, no, we'll give them food. I'm sorry, was that political? Food is a highly charged political thing. The disciples had the right idea. Make them go buy their own food. Hmm? Wait a minute. Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. He didn't give them something. He made the disciples do it. He took the money out of the disciples' pocket and gave it to the poor. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that charged? Oops. But do you see where this is going? This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. What did the prophets say? We look at Isaiah. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. You that have no money, come buy and eat. So the disciples weren't wrong. Go and buy food. But Jesus said, no, they need not go. Give them something to eat. And they said, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. This is one of the most amazing stories that I think we hear it so much since childhood that we overlook just how radical and amazing it is. He ordered the crowds to sit down. Think about it, 5,000 people. When's the last time you were surrounded by 5,000 men? Okay, and add how many women and children. Let's, let's just double the number. When's the last time you were surrounded by 10,000 people? A week ago, where were you at? And what is that... What does that look like? Is it a stadium full of people? Huge area. Now, what does five loaves of bread and two fish look like? Not much. I mean, you could lay it up here on this altar and still have room for more. You could fit that in a Fred Meyer bag, probably, if you tried real hard. That amount feeding a convention center. Are you with me? You see how crazy this is? Do you see why the disciples weren't wrong to say, make them go buy food? We don't have enough. And Jesus wasn't being a crazy socialist to say, give them something to eat. He was just being crazy. What? How are they going to be fed? Hungry, I tell you. <laughs> Hunger is all over the place. But we know the miracle. We know what happened. We know how the story ends. He took the bread and the fish. He looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. Wow. Now, I've heard it said by some who doubt Really, it wasn't a miracle of multiplying what was there. It's just that people had brought food with them, and once the disciples started sharing, everybody else took out what they had, and they shared too. I don't see that written here. I see a miracle taking place. This is what God's Word tells me. When Jesus wants hungry people fed, they get fed. Now, yes, we should share our food. Yes, we should share our bread. And yes, that is a miracle when we see the sharing multiplied. And I share with you and you share with someone else. It, it, sharing can be contagious in that way. When we see that in that basket full of groceries out there and this garden full of food, we see sharing at work. There's the literal side of food in the scriptures. But now we're getting into the realm of the figurative, of, of the not-so-literal when Jesus looked up into heaven, blessed and broke the bread, what do you see? Communion. It's a prefigure in some ways of communion. Just a little piece. 
And so we see that here. You know, this really isn't enough to fill you up. This, I, I don't even know if I'm going to call it bread. We call it a wafer. I'm loath to call it bread. It's, it's some sort of flour and water paste that gets smashed into a little wafer. And it gets the job done in a symbolic way, but it would never stave off your hunger, not, at least not in a miraculous, unless it was a miraculous feeding. No, it's a figurative foretaste of the feast to come. It reminds us that in that day when the Lord comes again, there will not be hunger. All will have plenty. Literally, will have plenty. Now it's a figurative sign, then it's a reality. That's what we see in Isaiah as well. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Everyone who thirsts. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Why? Because you're buying wine and milk without money because it has no price. You ever been in the store and seen something without a sticker on it? And someone says, how much does it cost? And you say, nothing. There's no sticker on it, right? That's the idea. In that case, really, it's true. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Now let's take bread as the word. That which we consume. Do you remember Alice in Wonderland? And she's falling down the rabbit hole. She comes across a curious little bottle that has a tag tied around it. And what does it say? Drink me. And what happens? Is that where she grows really big? Or is she shrinks? I can't remember anymore. The idea is that what we eat and drink transforms us. Where else do we see consuming something to transform us? We see the word of God in that way. Eat and be satisfied. What else satisfies you like the word of God? What other rich food do we have than God's word? We consume it. I like to think of the Bible having a little tag on it that says, eat me. You sit down and eat these words. How many of you have ever had to eat your words? Yeah, it doesn't taste very good, right? That crow tastes better with barbecue sauce, is the one I've always heard. This is not that bad, but sometimes we don't like the taste of what we read, and sometimes we do. We love the taste of Psalm 23. We love the taste of 1 Corinthians 13. We love the taste of some passages of Scripture better than others, and we love the taste of some Scriptures you know, the one that says, give to anyone who asks of you. Well, okay. The one that says, live according to God's law. We, well, which part of it? I'll eat some of that, but I'm not real partial to that. We have a rule in our household that uh, at the dinner table, if I serve something new, and I like to experiment with food, um, and so often the kids get something new, if Christy makes a dish that we've never had before, the rule is you have to try it. You've got to put one bite in your mouth and try it. If you don't like it, you can have a banana. You can have something that we don't have to prepare. Uh, if we've prepared food for you, you can go find something that you don't have to prepare. We'll give you plenty of, to eat, but it's going to come from a package that you open, probably. Uh, meaning peel, you know. <laughs> but you have to try it. And the idea is that gets inside of you and you think, oh, maybe that wasn't so bad. Maybe I'll have another bite. Gosh, I really like that. How is it with the Word of God? How many of you have read the Bible cover to cover? Anybody? All right, should we do a... How many of you have read, the, read it twice? Three times? Keep your hands up. Four times? Five? Oh, Alan, I knew you'd... Wait a minute, Craig, six... All right, Ellen, you got them. All right. I, I haven't even got it cover to cover that many times. All right. Maybe if you added it all up, maybe. We digest the word of God. We take it in. It's the rich food we need to delight ourselves. This is the call to eat what is good, and yet it's also the call to eat what is good, literally. Find scripture that makes sense in both ways, it's going to be food. 
eat and digest what is good. Nothing else satisfies like the Word of God. There are times in your life when things don't fit. Been there before? And you wake up in the morning, and no matter how long you go through the day, it just doesn't seem to quite work. You know, I practice Tai Chi. And we have a morning routine where you get up and kind of wake yourself up and do these moves. And on the days that I forget to do it, it feels different. Part of my morning routine is this. And then on the days that I forget to do it, I get too busy, it feels different. I get that call to come back and eat and be satisfied. And lo and behold, there's time left over. Well, I spend five minutes with the Word of God in the morning, and I have more time than I thought. The days that I forget and get up, it's like the time flies right by. Where did it go? Gosh, I'm late already. I get up and spend five minutes in the Word. I have time to do something with the kids. It's, it's strange how that works. This feeding miracle isn't just about feeding physically. Yeah, that's right. Our call is to feed on the Word of God. I think we've got the feed literally down pretty well. And I want to encourage you to keep giving if you're giving to the food bank. Keep giving and feeding if you're feeding in, in another feeding ministry. Um, I'm going to need, I'm going to be on vacation Monday and Tuesday. Well, not really. I'll be pulling up the floor in my kitchen, if you call that vacation. Um, I'm taking a couple of days off. There's zucchini, there's green beans, uh, there might be some cucumbers, I don't know. The lettuce is already bolting and the radishes are far gone. Um, but I'm looking for someone who can harvest uh, sometime. When you saw a hand go up, maybe. Somebody uh, who can come over here and harvest and deliver. You have a chance to get out, and I encourage you while you're out there in that garden to pick up something and eat it. It's good. So I think we've got the literal call for feeding down pretty well. Our call is to the figurative feeding, to feed ourselves on the Word of God, to be part of that nutrition, to make that part of our diet, to be satisfied on the rich food that God gives us in His Word. This is His promise to us. Let's partake and see that it is good.